On that day that they clicked open my door, on January 16, 2004, my door popped open and there wasn't guards standing there with clubs. It was fascinating. So she began at the mall where the victim worked, from the corner of the parking lot where her shoes were found. And I'm freaking out like, I, my mom's showing me how much she loved me, man. She takes me to where the woman was abducted. My heart's breaking, man. I know you you had did a prison escape, didn't you, when you were on death row? He pulls, a, he turns around, pulled a pistol out, tried to blow my brains out. I'm like, no. Made me so angry. I was just like, this, you know. Do, do you even now, right? Especially then, but now, do you just doubt all police? You went to Huntington to be broken. You get it? It wasn't yeah. you to be treated. You were there to be broken and they put you in silence and they beat you and they made you fight other men and they tortured you. When we got to the last barrier, they said, look, we made a mistake, man, you're not going home. Today, we are joined by Nick Yaris. Now, for those who don't know, I'm just gonna say, he's already been on the podcast before, telling an unbelievable story. Probably the best podcast I've ever created. Um, so you definitely need to check that one out if you haven't already. But this guy spent 22 years on death row uh, for a crime he didn't commit. He was exonerated. Uh, and the reason that we've got you on, in a couple of days' time, it's been 20 years since you've been a free man. So first and foremost, mate, what I think is more important than anything else, how are you? I feel like I'm just coincidentally completing not only the 20 years of my freedom, but I'm also completing a new book. So I had this sensation of feeling proud mm -hmm. that I had this mental perspective that my 20 years of freedom so far haven't broken me. I know that's a devastating thing to say to someone, mm -hmm. but when you go to death row and your family suffers and everyone that loved you suffers, when you try to come back to that point, it's impossible. There's no going back to that life, that person that you were, and everyone only remembers you from before anyway, so all of your living outside of that realm is unknown. Do you feel like you've, I know this is a crazy question to ask, but do you feel like you've been out longer than you've been in? No, it's strange. I, I was not a lucid person in my teenage years. I was constantly on drugs and out of my head on booze. And I didn't have the ingrained memory of that freedom. Mm. You know, it was a series of events, traumas and stuff that I remembered, right? But since I was sober and I haven't had a drink in 42 years and I haven't been out of my head on drugs or anything for 40 years now, all of this 20 years now has been remembered. And in detail of this one gift, I just met a man who left your podcast named Kevin Lane, and he and I instantly knew each other. You wanna know why? Why? When you're in the dungeons, there's no sensory input that's new. Mm -hmm. All you have is all your yesterdays. Get it? It's unbelievable. Yeah. And he and I know how to recall things in vivid detail because we were forced to over and over. So one of the things that I have a beautiful ability from being incarcerated, I have finite memory recall ability from events 20 years ago, so perfect that when I wrote it in this new book called Mind Your Heart, Nick Yaris, it was so cohesive and beautiful. You see, people know me from being on the Joe Rogan podcast or they know me from being on stage and these various things. I've been in movies and everything. But no one knew why I had to do this. Mm -hmm. You see, I could have gotten out of prison and walked away. That's what most people think, right? I didn't have that choice. See, I want to take you on a journey now. Imagine that you just spent 8,057 days in solitary confinement pushing you so hard that your baby brother dies in prison. Members of your family 
who hear you're on the phone calling home hate you so much they hang the phone up on you. And then you, you go through all this turmoil where you're pushed to the extreme where you have to ask to almost be executed to get your freedom back. And you do. On that day that they clicked open my door on January 16, 2004, my door popped open and there wasn't guards standing, there were clubs. It was fascinating. I was on this unit where it's maximum security level. Someone's always waiting for you if that door opens and they got clubs and they got chains and they got blue gloves on so they don't touch you. No human hand touched me over the last 15 years. I didn't know that was, I didn't know that it was that far. Like yeah, you man. can't even have human skin. I didn't have any contact over the last 15 years of my incarceration. And I was about to walk outside and start hugging people. And it was a, f it was a fearful thought. I was going to say, you'd be, you'd be f terrified of that thought. What's happening, guys? I hope you're enjoying the episode so far. If you are, please hit that like, hit the subscribe button, and press the notification bell so you don't miss another episode. Well, I had been so blessed with my studies of studying psychology. I read the Brazilian adoption of orphans study they did in the 50s where a hundred orphans were held and caressed by others and they nurtured and they grew and the other 50 were left alone and they withered and retarded it. And I, I, I really understood that. I was so ready for this moment to be free. I couldn't believe what happened. At 7.30, this miracle happens when my door opens. And I walk out onto the pod where I was living, and the strangest thing happened. The men around me who had killed many others began weeping and telling me they loved me and goodbye. Mm. You see, one of the things that made me survive is that I helped others. I wrote letters for their, their moms if they couldn't write a letter, or I helped them with their legal work, or I helped them with issues on the block if they couldn't get things, you know? It's fascinating. All these hardcore killers and gangsters were emotionally sending me off with love. But this is why, because, and this is probably why you connected with Kevin Lane. Kevin Lane served 20 years, innocent. Innocent man, he's done 20 years. He's off trying Same to overturn his country. Yeah. So there's probably a deeper level. And I would actually encourage you to, to connect with no, him. No, we already are. Okay. Yes, sir. Just because I think, I think that would be beneficial to both of you guys. Because there's not many men on the planet who are going to understand you like him. Yeah. To a degree. And, 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 even, and even not taking away from his story, but you were at the worst of the worst death row. Can I ask you, I don't think I asked you on the last podcast, did you pick your last meal? And everything as well. I was so defiant of that kind of luxury thought that I told him to burn it because I was so young and it was so long ago that I was sentenced to death. I was going to be electrocuted. So I facetiously used to tell them, just burn it. Whatever food it is, just burn it. But did you not want that for you to be selfish? No, I, I didn't mean? want to go in with that. All right, listen. One of the things that makes me who I am is that I had a duty I was going to be executed. I wasn't there to be a prisoner, okay? Yeah. My only duty was I didn't want to embarrass myself by the manner that I spoke before they pulled the switch. I didn't want to go out there and blubber or not have a focus. I, I didn't want to speak poorly about who I was as this human being that you were murdering. I wanted to give myself some form of empowerment so I began reading beautiful literature to myself. I began to speak politely to my own self-image on the wall. I began to have the preparation to be executed. Did, did, you, did you speak politely to the screws and stuff? Absolutely. So even though that they'll be waiting with clubs and ready to beat you down when oh, you ever... you don't understand. This was the hardest prison in America. It was condemned by the United Nations for its active practices of torture. What was the prison called? Huntington State Prison in Pennsylvania. Hmm. It was, that was that, that's where all the bad you, boys go in it. Because if you stabbed another prisoner in another prison or you attack staff 
you went to Huntington to be broken. You get it? It wasn't yeah. you to be treated. You were there to be broken, and they put you in silence, and they beat you, and they made you fight other men, and they tortured you. I went through all that. Thank God I did, because on the day of my release, I was about to face so much craziness. They walked me out of my unit and down through the prison, and then they made kind of offhand jokes about how it's really odd to see a man walk out of prison and all this that you've been in custody with for 20 years, like they were in jail beside me when they worked there. They put me in a van, and they drove me out across the prison, and as I got to the last, it's called a sally port where the gate is, and they let the vans in and out, they let me in. And they closed the gate behind me. I'm like, fuck yes, I'm out of here. I can see my mom and dad across the road, and people were there with the press. And when we got to the last barrier, they said, look, we made a mistake, man. You're not going home. Was that on purpose? No. No, they, they actually made a mistake. They said, the state of Florida didn't get your release paperwork stamped. There's a lawyer getting on a, an airplane in Fort Lauderdale, flying right now to Tallahassee, Florida, so that he can get the papers stamped in the state of Florida for your release today. I couldn't believe it. But the most miraculous thing happened when they took me back to the prison. They asked me, what did I want? I said, just don't put me in a cell. I've just done that. Just put me in a room so somewhere. So they were just waiting for you to get your actual release sold so out? Just put me in a room somewhere yeah. that it's not a cell, and I'm cool. Mm -hmm. I don't want to sit there with a metal toilet and a bunk in a cell. Let me sit like a human being. I just got the shock of my life where you almost let me out the door, man. <sighs> I know. And I'm trying to keep my shit together. Did they honor that? Did they let you stand in order? Yeah, so they put me in this big property room, and a sergeant came in who was a Baptist minister in his personal life, six foot four, dark skinned black man with a beautiful voice named Sergeant Barr. And he stood there beside me, and he took, not pity, but I got to tell you who this man was. This man worked in the prison beside his father, who was a captain, and that man was murdered by two prisoners. This sergeant continued to work in that same prison for three years without harming them men. Fucking crazy. I know. Yeah, man. I was so beside myself with what just happened. I was shook, you know. And he said to me, man, what can I do for you? I said, I don't know, Sarge. And then I had the courage. I'd known this man for years, but I never had the courage. I thought, what's the worst you can do? Just tell me to shut the up you know so I said Sarge why didn't you hurt the men that killed your dad and he looked at me you know he gave me that forever look and I waited and I waited like he was thinking about it and he said when I was growing up every to everybody told me I looked exactly like my father my father was a brilliant handsome man I thought about them men and how to get revenge on them. I did. By being there and looking at them. But the good, but the good Lord wouldn't me, let me lay hands on them. So instead, every time I saw them in the hallway and I passed them, I smiled brightly like my father did. He said, yeah. that was the reminder for them to remember their sin, not mine. I was like, what a message to get. Maybe there's something there. So they waited hours. And meanwhile, when the sergeant stepped off, all these guards kept coming in and saying this basically the same thing. Sorry, Mr. Yaris. And they weren't calling me inmate. They weren't calling me by my first mm. name. It was directly Mr. Yaris. I had my surname back. Mm. I was AM 68, 41 for 23 years, mm. man. Hell, man. And they were saying it to me, and I realized Sarge was making them say that shit to me. Because these were the men that beat me and stomped me and hurt me and yeah. did all kind of things to me. I shook their hands, man, like a man. You learned something off him, didn't you, then, to, to, to have that? Yeah, it was like he needed to tell me that story about his father so he could send me these men so I wouldn't leave here with anger. Yeah. It blew my mind. And then I finally get released and I walk out the front doors, no more van. 
and my mom burst through these prison officers and hugged me, and it was like a bullet. And I caught her body, and I felt her femininity. It was just killing me, man. Here's home. I don't care where you are on the planet. When your mother hugs you, that's your home. And I was like, whoa, I got to keep my shit together. I can't cry. I can't get upset. I got to hold it together because she's looking at me like I'm getting my Nikki back. My son needs to be strong. She always said, didn't she, just come home? Yeah. All them years. That's all she said. Just come home to me. I'll fix you. So I next saw my dad, and he came around the corner, and he hugged me, and he was tiny, man. It was weird. My dad was always working two jobs, always fit. But he was 70, and he was frail, my arms, and I overwhelmed him almost, and he was getting emotional, and I knew right then I had to break the code, you know? I had to get that thing out of his head. So I said, Pop, be cool, man. If they see you crying, they're going to change their f***ing minds again. He started laughing. He's yeah. like, oh, he did, you know? Yeah. So I turn, and I look, and there goes my ex-wife. I married this woman while I was on death row. She came to visit me as part of this program to try and shut down the hellhole prison I was in. And she fell in love with me. And at first I was so messed up in the head, I couldn't tell her I was innocent. You see, I was more embarrassed by putting myself on death row, making up a stupid story to get out of my original charges. I would rather set someone believe I killed a woman and raped her than to embarrass myself saying that I put myself on death row. That's stupid though, because yeah, not when you're embarrassment can't be greater than the thought of being tagged with a crime like that. Let me look you in the eye and say the reason I'm sitting on death row is because I put myself here without even killing someone and tell me that it couldn't f***ing hurt. Yeah, I get that. Obviously not to your degree, but yeah. I couldn't mentally argue yeah, on yeah, my yeah. behalf to when, people. When if it was the crime... <laughs> you would have had a justification. After a while, I couldn't bring myself to tell people I was innocent. You know what's mad, Nick? I saw a photo of you recently, um, probably a couple of weeks back now. I think I saw it on Instagram somewhere. And you looked so young. You had, like, longish hair. 20 years old. I think you were wearing, like, a white shirt or something. You looked cool as fuck, to 20, be honest. Yeah, it was 20 years old. And man. I was like, Because I, obviously, bear in mind, I've had you on the podcast before, and I'd never seen that photo prior to that. So right. all I saw before me was the man that I saw then. Yeah. The podcast itself's improved a lot now. So we 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 incorporate a lot of um, clips and footage yeah. and photos to tell the story. Want to know what's context. fascinating? Yeah. I didn't, that was the last image I had in my head of myself because I didn't have a mirror in myself. Yeah. Imagine this, man, like, I developed from 20 years old until the age of 42 without ever seeing myself hardly. Yeah, man. When I got out, it, so d curiosity. I want to stick to this first day, though. It's so important. Yeah, yeah. All right. I looked at my wife that I had this amazing nine-year relationship with standing outside the prison, and she was the third person to hug me. And it was getting hard, man. I got into her car, and she drove me to a restaurant nearby. So my parents, who were being driven by a family friend named Pam Tucker, could all go and chill after this excitement of getting out, you know? And as this woman was driving beside me, I felt so heartbroken for her, having invested all those years with me. And then when the evidence spilled, she thought I was going to die in there, so she left me, and now she had the grace to come back. Mm. It was so hard on her, I imagine, because I was the man of her dreams who she was going to help set free, and we were going to drive off like this one day. But instead, she was going to go back to her house with her partner, Bob, and I was going to go to Philadelphia with my family and get hit by shit that you wouldn't even believe. Did she, the thing is, when she's met you, you're on death row. She must know you're never getting out, you're on death row. It didn't matter to her, she just was confused. But what does a woman want to do with a guy who's going to get She couldn't executed? believe that I had no complaints. She went there to yeah. interview inmates as part of a lawsuit, and I had no complaints. And she said, somebody's got a complaint. 
And I was like, no, you don't understand. I'm happy. I'm ha I was like three quarters of, of the way through the world's religions. I was doing all these studies. I was, I was okay mentally. I had 105 years plus a death penalty. I knew I was going to die in there. So, so I, that was your reality I, anyway? That was my reality. There was no such thing as DNA. So forget about getting out. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Just live. And I was, I was. I was doing these amazing things that when I met her, she was like, so what's your, your main complaint? Is it the violence? Is it the food? Or is it the water? Because it used to be brown. The water would be brown in the rain and stuff. I said, no. Honestly, I just can't get a good cup of coffee to save my life. And that just pissed her off. You, so she came, can't. she came back by herself the week after that first visit and the week after and the week after and the week after. And she's starting to fall in love with me and I'm feeling like a piece of shit. I actually was at the point where I was going to tell her to leave me alone when I found out about DNA testing. And I became the first man in America to ask for DNA testing from death row. But what, for me, and I understand and I appreciate she must have been some woman. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. She was a psychiatric aide for juvenile children in a psychiatric hospital in Pittsburgh. Very well educated. But, but what's in it for her, being with you? No, no, no. no and again, I don't mean that I in get any it, way. But, but you know what it is? It's the person. It's the human being. Yeah, look, but what I'm saying is, if there's, right, no, look, there's no yeah, contact, there's no sex, there's, no, there's none of the other connections. Didn't I need that it. doesn't mean that. Had the most amazing love affair with her for nine years and only held her hand for 15 minutes during our wedding ceremony. We didn't touch, but tell a person in a wheelchair they're not in love with their current partner. Tell a person who's incapacitated that that's not full. Okay, so... I had, listen to me. Yeah. I had the most intense, romantic, sexual, brilliant love affair with my wife for nine years. Mm -hmm. I couldn't have intercourse with her, but I made love to her in every possible conceivable way. And she taught me how to listen to a woman, how to speak to a woman. She came to visit me six times a month for nine years. Yeah, man. I get that, man. Yeah, and, and that's what I'm saying. I'm not disputing the love. I just... Okay, so... So listen to this. If you're a woman, mm -hmm. men out here will not pay you one-tenth of the time a man incarcerated will pay you. Everything yeah, in I life is that. you. Everything in my life was Jackie. Get it? How does it compare, Nicky, to, to when you've been in relationships since your ex-wife? Because when you can touch and feel and, right. and and how does that truly compare to? Again, not saying of course. No, you but were all right. So enough, so I have, yeah, but I also have a magnetism, a magnificence brought upon by deprivation. That fifteen years that I was not allowed to touch someone made me an intense lover. I have an ability, especially when I go on stage and I harness the energy of an audience. My body's hybrating at such a high level, my partners would come again and again and again from me. I harness energy because I was so starved of it as some kind of weird gift. I can just go on stage, and by the time I came off the stage in Ireland, steam's coming off of me. I had to exit the room. Every single person in attendance had to hug me. Male or female, they had to touch me. Something's going on. I don't know what the fuck it is, but I know where it started. It started on my first day. And I'm going to keep coming back to this because it's so important for you to know this. After I drove with Jackie in the car and I still kept myself together, I sat with my parents in a restaurant and I had some bread because I couldn't eat. It was too much acid in my stomach. This is such a big day. Then we began a a long journey of 300 miles from where I was down to Philadelphia to my parents' house so I could meet my family and they were going to have a party that night. So with my parents sitting behind me in the car, we began driving this journey and about halfway through, my sister rang. She was the one that hung up on me when my little brother Marty died of a drug overdose telling me not to ever call this f***ing house again because she hated me. I embarrassed the family. I went to prison. I was a scumbag junkie when I was a kid. You know what I mean? But you did not wrong. 
it was an easy shot to take when she lost her little brother. Did and she I, not believe you? She didn't. No, she, she hated me because I caused so much embarrassment to her. But did you cause that? Or was I, that did, the, I did. I did. I was the, a the junkie law, loser like, thief. I used to steal from her. Yeah. Okay. She couldn't see my development in prison. She just remembered the asshole that I was. Which is understandable, isn't it? Yeah. I throw my hands up. So it was like my mom's first test that could her family, which been ripped apart, have some kind of normal. So I told my mom, yeah, tell, tell my sister she could be there. That's fine. And then we drove down to Philadelphia, and when we got there, she was waiting upstairs while everybody else was in the living room. And she came down the steps, like, she's the queen of the family, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, of course. And I met her halfway up the steps because I didn't want it to be an embarrassment to me. And I was so nervous about all this shit because I don't know anybody. I just saw photographs of these people growing up. Like, I, didn't, I was only going to have a, a bed for one night because my nephew was in federal prison for federal bank robberies. His girlfriend and his girlfriend's child with him was living at my parents' house. My brother's in the hospital. He got hit by a car four days before my release, and he's got his leg severely broken. So I got this one night at home. I just wanted, I'm trying to hold it together, man. I go upstairs with my sister, and she starts standing in front of this mirror preening, and she says, you know, Everyone thinks we're up here making up and all that. But I want you to know something. I hate you, man, and I can't stop hating you. And when we go back downstairs, I'm going to pretend like everything's cool, okay? And I was like, yeah. I didn't have any strength in my personality yet. I was still dealing with all this shock of just being released. I went along with it all, you know? So before I came in the house, I did a press interview in front of the house and everything. And about 10 o'clock that night when the news came on, everybody was waiting to see the news in front of my parents' house, you know? I slid all the way back in the corner, man, because now this day is just going on with hugs and touches, and everybody's getting fucking high on booze and telling me what a junkie loser I am, and I can't get high. And I'm like, yeah, I don't want to get high. I can see what you're doing in your lives, you know? And the news come on, and I sat way back against the wall, and I couldn't believe what I looked like. I was fucking horrified. I was a 42-year-old man wearing prison eyeglasses, a prison baseball cap, and I didn't fit my clothes and I didn't fit my head for who this person was. Uh, I was the voice of this narrator. I couldn't see outside. Almost like watching a movie of you. My head up. And then... It messed me up so bad, I sat down at this big, long table. My dad was next to me on the left. And I said, Dad, my lawyers want me to go down and do this big um, press interview. And I don't feel comfortable doing this because I've lost my hair. And I don't know if I should wear a nice suit with a hat. That's when my sister, who hung up the phone on me, snapped the fuck out on me, told me how stupid I was how I was going to continue to embarrass this family, like just launched on me. And I was freaking out because in prison, when someone yells, someone bleeds. It's instantaneous. There's no, hmm. my dad defended me and told her to shut the fuck up. They don't, you didn't know what they did to that boy in the cell. That's my son. You leave him alone, you know? I was so horrified by this dysfunctional bullshit. I stood up and went down to the basement because I couldn't handle it. There was no blood. There was no violence. I can't be around yelling if there's no response. Although it was your sister, would you have thrived off violence? No, I was, I was so conditioned to it. Yeah. When it didn't happen, I had that immediate let go of the aftermath of the anticlimactic expectation, and it made me freak out. You know, you know when you're on death row, Nick, in... So you, you've got a, a date or whatever, or you're going to get killed. You're going to get executed, rather. Electric chair. How, because obviously at that point, good job you didn't think this way because you got out and you were, you were innocent and that may have led to the, the decisions you took. You, you know, you bettered yourself. If you commit a crime on death row, what's the punishment? Oh, if you kill another, you're going to die. You get another, yeah, they'll put another death penalty on top of you. Well, you've got to you get one. 
Yeah, but that makes sure if the first one fails, you're done. See, because you can get a technicality. You can get off on a also, technicality. So if, if, if a death row penalty fails, what happens? Do you so, go down to normal? Yeah, so you spend, you do the wheel forever, oh, man. Oh, fucking hell. That's even worse. Yeah, I was going to say, wouldn't you rather be killed? That's why I asked to be dead. Yes. I know, I, I know this sounds, again, I was going to ask this question. It sounds f- stupid, but because the people who've had the punishment are dead. What about the people, have you, have you ever spoke to anybody who they've tried to execute and it hasn't worked and they've came back onto death row? And yeah. they were like, yeah, I started feeling the electric and or not. Or is no, that- but I, I do know of a, a guy named Terry who was falsely convicted of murder, mm-hmm. proved his innocence, went out to Arizona and killed someone anyway. Oh. Fucking hell. Like you, I, you couldn't convince me there was a need for that. I, d- I don't get that. After your life at the age of 20-something was taken from you in Delaware County, you go out to Arizona after you prove your innocence and you end up actually killing someone? How much well, anger did you take out? Maybe I don't know what that was. I am grateful that I managed to survive my first night of freedom because after that blowout with my family, I ended up in the basement and I was so mentally challenged I had to go out back. My my father went to sleep right after that, and it's like one o'clock in the morning now, and I just got the fuck out. And I had to go outside and open the door constantly to the back door and walk out into the night and make sure it was all still real. I didn't trust myself to go to sleep. It was that traumatic. On the, the proceeding, on the next morning, that of my freedom, my mother took me out in her car, and I'll never forget the, how this went. She took me to the murder scene. Of the my mother know. fought for me the whole time I was out of, in, inside prison. She did her own investigation, man. The murder happened 26 miles from my house. My mother was making dinner for me at the time of the murder. You couldn't convince this woman I did anything because I was sitting in front of her. Yeah, yeah. So in one of the craziest things is she not only wrote letters and everything, but she conducted her own physical investigation of the layout of where the crime happened. So she began at the mall where the victim worked from the corner of the parking lot where her shoes were found. My mother drove me there. And I'm freaking out. Like, I, my mom's showing me how much she loved me, man. Mm. She takes me to where the woman was abducted. My heart's breaking, man. Mm. My mom told me, look, there had to be someone that knows the area. Because then she drove me to the church where the woman was driven and then raped. And her body was dumped behind the church. And then to where the car, her car was found was like a triangle so that you could get from the car back to the mall. Someone left their car at the mall after they... Why did she take you round there? Huh? Why did your mom she take She was you? going to take me out for ice cream. Mm. She said she wanted to break all this feeling of all this negativity. She felt bad for me. She wanted to take me to a place called Betty's Ice Cream Parlor out in Westchester, Pennsylvania. But on the way, she started just... She needed to show me that it wasn't just me who was strong. And she said, Nikki, they wouldn't listen to me, but whoever did it had to be from this area because no one else would know to do all this. And I'm sitting there, and then she said to me, I need you to do me a favor. I need you really to give up all your anger and be a polite man and a sweet man and caring man because if you can do this for me, that will show respect for my family and what they did to my family because it's not right how Poppy kept getting fired from jobs or the police always had to abuse your brothers because of your name. She said people in the neighborhood used to ring me up all hours of the night telling me I was the mother of a monster. Please be a nice man. You see? So I'm stuck in a situation where I'm in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Everyone around me is addicted to drugs, alcohol, 
and it's all degraded and broken down. <coughs> <coughs> I spent my first weeks of freedom sleeping on the very spot where my little brother died of a drug overboat dose in the bar my parents' basement. My brother had to have my bed. I had nowhere to sleep but in the basement on a sofa. And I swore right then and there, I couldn't let this go and I just walk away and just become a junkie or a drunk. I had to do something magnificent. I had to do something so big I would have a lifelong self-belief in myself. So I started this incredible effort where sitting on my parents' sofa, I began an F economic platform of speaking against Pennsylvania in five different European countries. Within 10 months of my release, I was at the Colosseum in Rome with 20,000 people listening to me talk. I, mind blowing up. I know. I was so powerful. I was here in England speaking to a combined session of the lower house of parliament when Kofi Annan, UN Secretary General of the time, walked up to me and personally said, my God, you are one of the finest speakers I've ever heard in my life. Did you, do you, even now, right, especially then, but now, do you just doubt all police? No, I love the police, man. Listen, you got to understand, it's the 10% rule. I don't care if it's <laughs> hockey players, footballers, cricketers, 10% uh, rule, you ready? Mm -hmm. There's always 10% of assholes. And that 10% does so much damage. If you throw a painted brush at every cop, police officer, whatever, you disrespect yourself. I understand that, but I also understand that it wasn't just one man or two men who had something to do with this. There why does my, yeah, but why you, does you, my personal trauma have to give me a reason to disrespect a man I don't know? I never met that officer. And yet, every time I meet a police officer, I'm super polite. I'm super nice to him. Want to know why? It might help the next person he deals with. <clears throat> it's like that hubris you were talking about, wasn't it? It's having that about you and understanding that. You're just carrying yourself in such a way where if you're nice to everybody as well and, and you know, portray that, then this you're right. This is your energy, your personality is derived of three factors. You ready? Mm -hmm. The accumulated knowledge that brought you to this point, mm -hmm. your energy, and your mindset projection upon who you are to others. Think about that. Yeah. Everything that you've gone through before this moment is a memory. The only way you can share it with me is now a memory. And now. Yeah. And now. And now. Yeah. But do you see my point? Yeah, of course I do. I can't know about your teenage years. You know them. And the only way I could ever share them from you is your memory. Is this a way for you to justify that in your own mind, though? Because they still fucking done you wrong, and they took your life away. Good. Regardless whether it was one man or a hundred men. God saved my life by sending me to death row, is what I say. You're thinking of one factor... I'm looking at how all my childhood friends are dead. Everyone I knew growing up is dead on drugs or ruin. God saved me by putting me into one place where I couldn't be able to kill another prisoner. I had to be in solitary confinement, and I had to escape the AIDS epidemic, the crack epidemic. All of the deterioration of the 80s, I was spared. But that's because you've served the time. If, you're, if you had a son... You and was you and he got sentenced to death row? Would you say they're doing you a favor, son? Wrongly convicted, or would you be like, no, fuck them? I I wouldn't apply my life to any other. But do, do, you, get, do you get what I'm saying, though? Because yeah, but I understand the gift that I was given. Yeah, and you have been. I have I, been. I get that. I look at the thousands of lives that I've saved since my release. People yeah. have literally, on the verge of killing themselves, heard me speak and said, no. Nah, Mm. Well, mate, even, even from the last podcast, right, I've had countless messages off the last podcast saying, mate, that guy who you had on, he's literally, like, even the fact that you've given them more of an uplift in their day, once, yeah. and that's happened countless times. I know. So There's even, so even that in people. itself, but does it, does it require going through 22 years of facing Maybe it that? does. Maybe, maybe you only reach a level 
of harmonization with who you are from torture that you can then offer a gift. The, I honestly believe I couldn't reach you yeah. and I couldn't reach your audience without being absolutely devastating in life and have the grace to come back with kindness. Because want to know what the truth is? They all want to know that's within them. Yeah, the yeah, reaction right. that I invariably get from other is, soon as I'm done speaking, they want to show me how good they are. Physically and verbally, they have to tell me a good about themselves. You know, I went through. Yeah. And what that shows is they have a draw towards good. I think as well what you have been gifted, almost the way I look at it like is, could be like, you're like a vessel of, I know this sounds just bad with us, like a vessel of light, right? Or positive energy, right? That's me meandering around the universe. And any man or woman or anybody in the world who comes across someone like yourself, because not many people do because of how, how crazy your situation was, I feel like no matter what I want to pour out to you, it's okay because you've seen worse. Right. Do you get what I'm saying? I know. So I feel like that's all. That's the gift. Because like, if I said to you, Nick, you know, I'm battling with this, you could be like, Ads, you know, I knew a guy who killed 27 people and he had to deal with it in this way. You know, like there's always... But that's this is, what you've got, I think. But this is what we're all striving for. We all hope we can find a part of us in our most cherished personality that we find. Yeah. We want to be Mandela. We want to be Michael Jordan. We want to be part of something greater than ourselves. Or we want to recognize a part of ourselves in that person. And that's what draws us to him. So it, I like it that I am drawn by the empathy gene. Yeah, And the empathy gene is so strong within some people, they will traverse the world to go be near another empath. Do, what do, because you've obviously met some wonderful people who have clearly been inspired by your journey to initiate a conversation. We'll use Joe Rogan as an example. Right. How did Joe Rogan find you? I don't really know. My life was in such a vortex when that yeah. happened that I couldn't believe what I do. That's cool. Yeah. My life was in a complete vortex in 2018 when I did Joe's podcast. I was actually duped into going meeting Oprah Winfrey's husband the night before. I was exhausted. I was having marital difficulties. And it came out. I was an emotional wreck. As you've seen, we've sat here for this time, and there's not been one unleveled emotional outburst of crying yeah, because yeah. my life isn't as destroyed as it was you, then. You seem in control. I was just in the aftermath of a Sid's death in my life. Do you think it was a bad idea to go on Joe Rogan? No, what was a bad idea was wearing a shirt for an alcohol company and selling out. And uh, what was bad it was being led to do other things when I should have focused on what was primarily my most important goal, going on there and telling my story in a beautiful manner, and I failed. Do you not think you redeemed yourself when you did other big podcasts, though? No, I, I'll always be a critic like that because then I can strive harder. Even today, I've said the word, um, and I'm disappointed. I can go through two hours of speaking and never use that which is not even a nonsensical word. But yeah, I said the word um, and I'm put off by that. That's the strive for, for greatness, though. Yeah, because what if it's your deaf speech? But is it not a good no, thing that you're put off by that, so you know yeah, it's because I, how to learn? I always want to do better and better for someone, because I consider you my friend now. And I would never come in here and not think about, well, if I ever get a chance to sit before my friend, I'll make sure. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I, I consider myself one of the finest speakers in the world. But you've got to fail to be that finest speaker. You've got to say the um. You've got to fuck it up. No, you don't. Do you not? No. How are you ever going to get better? I'm, I'm articulating words. Um is a sound. Mm. I do apologize. I was caught between thoughts, and I allowed a reversion back to how I used to speak. And I'm really down on myself. For I here. would love to know how you used to speak before prison. Be I know you said it was yeah, such it, a mad... So, like, yo, man, I'm going to put that John in the car, man. 
Modern. I just told you I was putting a gun into a car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So John, everything in Philadelphia is John, and everything's like Rocky, and everything is guttural, dismissive, angry almost. I want to ask you, Nick, because I know I didn't mention it on the last podcast, and, and I know that we've discussed your freedom and stuff, which, again, that that is you now. You're a free man um, and, and living this life and, and pursuing um, the next chapter, if you like. I know you you had did a prison escape, didn't you, when you were on death row? Yeah. Can we talk about that? And yeah, how, so how did you manage to escape from death row? I was row? being transported to a hearing for a new trial. So I was actually anxious to go to court in a snowstorm in February 15, 1985. I was 24 years old, and I was fit as fuck, and I needed to be. Uh, we stopped to use the toilet, and anybody that wears um, glasses knows when you get out of a warm car eyeglasses, fog up, go into a cubicle, breathe while looking down the urine, eyeglasses fog up. When I turned to come out of the cubicle after I urinated, the officer with me had to go to the toilet so bad, he made a tactical decision to leave me on my own, go back to the car. Why would he, why would he do that? He was going to piss himself. He was 68 years old. He testified at my trial. They were both honest. He said, look, I yeah, had... Yeah. I'm being honest. I got a, a bladder the size of a pea. I'm standing there watching someone pee. I got to go. It's freezing cold. I thought, just push him, let him go. So, unfortunately for me, the other officer had his back turned to me with a cigarette. And when he turned around, I was already running at him when he thought I had already overpowered his partner when he pulled his pistol out and fired. So, what'd you do? Run at him? I was running at him with my head down, and I didn't notice till the last second. I'm freezing. I got on a, a simple shirt, a prison t uh, work shirt. Mm -hmm. prison trousers and leather prison shoes I haven't worn shoes in two and a half years i'm freezing and my feet are aching and i'm getting back in that car man it's below zero yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. jesus he pulls a, he turns around pulled the pistol out and tried to blow my brains out i'm like no and i ran but my hands were cuffed so I fell and scraped all the, all the skin off my hands, and it made me so angry. I was just like, fuck this, you know? And I ran towards this plate glass window of a restaurant, and he couldn't shoot me because of the patrons in the restaurant. Then I ducked around the building, went right, went right, and I hid behind their vehicle for about an hour until I saw a police building off in the distance. I hid behind there for an hour. Then when I came out of there, someone saw me in a helicopter and started chasing me for four hours. Oh, is that you know, how long you escaped for? No, man. I got away. Like, I slalomed down a snowbank on my face, got buried in snow. The helicopter couldn't find me. I got up and walked five miles to Fraser, Pennsylvania, stole a 65 Ford Mustang, drove to New York City, and got the f*** out of there. Like, yeah. You just stole a parked car or off some Yeah, bike. because yeah. it didn't have lock steering. It was 1965. And how did that fail? Did you think, I'm aware? What was going through your no, mind? No, it was Where scary you because I put on KYW news. Dip, 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 top of the hour. Police in extant area. Oh, you know those voices, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah, so it was like police in extant area warning residents to stay indoors. Escape serial killer. Escape rapist murderer Nick Yaris is on the loose. He broke custody from Delaware County Sheriff's and is considered armed and extremely dangerous. Police have a shoot on sight order. And you heard that as you're driving. Yeah, and I'm like, F I hope they get that guy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, mate, do you, what's your relationship like with the police? I don't have a problem with police. What about the police who fitted you up? Yeah, but that was 20... That was, I know we're saying there's no... Yes, yeah, 40 years ago. Was the guy the, ever caught? Yeah, the, so... The real guy? No, that's the thing that I keep fighting for. I, every year, I even contacted the district attorney. Every year at Christmas time... I contact them and ask them to do those 23andMe DNA searches for the real killer, man. So he's still out there now. He's still out there. And I had to fight for the victim because they weren't trying to make that effort. And it's mad because you've been on all these podcasts and stuff and you've had hundreds of millions of views. He will know who the fuck you are. Or he's dead. Yeah, so I used to get taunting letters while I was on death row from the Chicago area. Do you have your own feeling on who it could be? I don't, but I do know that the witnesses said it was a person, five, seven, five, eight, dark brown, greasy hair. I don't know who that is, but whoever it was, I paid for their crime. And what about the victim's family? 
they still hate me because they think I am somehow involved. Even though you're free. Yeah, man, because when you hate somebody that many Christmases and all those years, you can't stop. And I suppose if they don't hate you, then who? Yeah, who are they going to give that hate to? In year, years spent on that death row scenario, I know the last 15 you didn't have any kind of human touch. What did you learn from the bad things you saw in there? Oh, never lose your humanity. No matter how much violence, ugliness, or pain is around you, if you give up your humanity, you give up who you are. What's giving up your humanity? Your feelings for other persons, your compassion for them, your empathy towards the person who has less than you. As soon as you lose that, someone has stolen your kindness, and you can just write it off, man. You're going to go to bitterness. So, for instance, if somebody's beaten you up, they're less than you, aren't they, really? Well, so do it, you show compassion I to the one to, who's inflicting pain on you? I used to f*** them up in prison when I felt pity for them. Mm -hmm. when, my, when my tormentors, and I had a few in there... Were the big names as well? Like, no, well, these were prison officers oh, who right, okay, okay. decided that I was a rapist murderer, and I, I was convicted of killing a woman because she supposedly looked like my girlfriend. So they thought I was deranged, and they treated me with this cruel deference like I was almost retarded in the manner that they spoke to me and they had no feelings for me at all and they would just do brutal things, spit in my food, stomp my face, dress me up for a visit, tell me my mother's there and then leave me at my door laughing. With your head, torment you. I can't, you. can't even imagine it, bro. I watched 11 men commit suicide. The first couple really bothered me, but then I started to understand. Some people can't be ugly. And if the world is so ugly, they couldn't be part of it. And I tried to get through to them, but I couldn't because it was too much for them and I didn't have the ability to get through to them. When, when someone arrives on death row, Nick, in, I, I mean, just trying to paint a picture, is the, I mean, the, the close I can get to is things I've seen on TV. And I don't know what the UK want to show from, the, from, Amer from America and vice versa. Is it basically just a bunch of cells with someone in them, like dog cages? Yeah, man. And is there a lot, of like 100 guys or I 10 had, guys? Like at is one point, I had 244 men around me all on death row, on one unit. Fucking hell, They man. used to make us just go out or just to get the frustrations out. They used and what, to make us go out and fight just what is, for some sport. Because I know that obviously there's rapists, child murderers, and all the, the, the worst type of shit. But... What what does the I know you can't really say what do the crimes range from because it's everything but what is the like maximum shit people have done on there to the to the least you know what I mean like well uh, the, but they're both getting killed yeah the cannibals the cannibals yeah man, uh, hell, man. I got to live with memories of men who boasted about cooking and eating human beings man it's some deep shit especially when they're mentally driven. And they're psychotic. Do you want to kill them? No. Do you want to rip them apart? No, I don't want to give my life up for yeah, anyone. No one that. on this planet is worth my life. Yes, but bear in mind... Yeah, but when you executed. kill someone, listen to me, you yeah. give your life away potentially right there on the spot. Mm -hmm. That person that you're going to attack and kill is worth your life. Think mm -hmm. about that. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. No one on this planet is worth my life. I'm not going to kill anyone. Who taught you that? I did. Have that in you. I did. Knowing that you're going to get killed My yourself. mother said to me, you come home to me. Whatever it takes, that means no killing. Fucked a lot of dudes up in there. My hands are just destroyed from all the fights I've been in. My head and my face has been split up so much. I got deep gouges all down my face from getting my face ripped. Did, at what extent would you not kill someone? Just Even take, if they're trying to kill you. So what? I, oh, you know how many times I've almost been murdered in prison for a bounty on me, man? Look, people stabbed me multiple times. I didn't mean I had to kill them. I just did my best to incapacitate them. I left them with broken fingers or noses, or I gouged their eyes, or I did things instantaneously to knock them down. Mm. I'm probably one of the most well-trained assassins you'll ever meet, and I only need 10 to 12 seconds to f*** your life up. <laughs> Can, that's all you're going to get a chance at. You better be ready. 
crazy. And did I you know. learn that art of combat? In I that? had to. I was being, it was being used against me. I've been garroted. I've been stabbed. I've been attacked with different weapons where they shot me with, or tried to shoot me with objects from a, a catapult that they made in their cell. I, I've had things thrown on me, uh, bleach. They, they will burn you in your cell if they can get a hold of gasoline, man. It's, it's full-on warfare, but you only have a minute, 30 seconds, to do everything. You better did, be did ready. You ever, did, they, did they ever try to rape you and stuff like that? No, solitary no. confinement, man. Oh, there ain't right, no time for no crazy shit like that. Yeah, true. All it was was gladiators on the Sundays when the lieutenant was How around. the man shouldn't stab you and stuff? I can make a weapon out of anything. I can kill you with a ballpoint pen, all kind of things. I can kill you with a magazine and a, and a pair of underwear. <laughs> I'm not kidding, <laughs> man. Fucking hell, man. Ask Kevin. Kevin can make some great yeah, weapons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen some of the Look, shit. That, yeah, on TV. What it comes down to is I was in a world that was upside down. And the three ways you could tell it is, when you're in prison, you keep your mouth shut about another person, you don't talk about their family, and you damn sure don't make fun of their religious beliefs. Out here, they will mock you for where you're at, they will mock your family, and they will mock your religion. And those are the three things that get you killed in prison. Out here, people expound their opinions like it's water, whereas in prison, everyone keeps to their self. Because this way here, you get kept out of the drama. You kept your opinion to yourself. You kept your mind to yourself. You didn't put it out there on the block. Someone to smash your face in. Did you do a documentary on Netflix? Yeah, Have called you... The Fear of 13. Yeah. I've but... never actually watched that yet. Is that, is that on you, is it? Because someone I know who actually said he's watching yeah, it. Yeah, so in 2015, it finally got released. I made it in 2007 in Ealing um, Studios with David Sinkton. And it's about to be re-released on one of the stream, streaming platforms. I'm proud to say it got 96% Rotten Tomatoes approval. It's a brilliant documentary. How much is it close to the original? No, you don't understand. It's just me sitting down like this with you for 96 All minutes. right, I see. With beautiful imagery behind me telling different parts. Is it hard for you to talk about your life? No, because it's become cathartic. Is it hard for you to talk about your life? No. Me either. What I do is I take perspective uh, away from it. I'll learn different manners in which I should ad address different things, hoping that I get a better clarity. I am a professional speaker first and foremost, but I'm also living one of the most gregarious, amazing stories ever. Do you f struggle to trust people though? No, why should I? Just because you've lived with some beasts. Yeah, but that's not and the ones that have hurt me. That are not convicted yeah, yet. but the people out here on the street have hurt me more than death row. Right, okay. The hardest 20 years of my life are about to finish. Yeah. The hardest 20 Isn't years of my mad, life. Mad. I know. I'm sitting here before you with brain injury from it. Oh, no. I got, I have no home. I'm oh, homeless. No. I lost millions upon millions. I go around doing all this good knowing that I have to live this way or I couldn't meet you. I couldn't meet these other people. I couldn't get through to them. When you were exonerated, I know there was, a, there was a, a settlement fee or something like that, wasn't there? Yeah, but by the time that came it through, I never got $4 million. It's a misnomer. My lawyer got a million off the top, plus 200000 for the investigator. And then from there, I went through the exchange rate of being 1.9 to the pound in 2008. Did you get taxed on it? Yeah. So I got... I, I know. I ended up splitting from my partner... And she was convincing me the courts were going to take half anyway, so I ended up giving her a million dollars so that my daughter, Laura Rebecca Yaris, would have a good life. I wasn't being with a woman that punched me in the face. Oh, she got that good life. Uh, yeah, she is. In fact, she was in school 2023 when Sean Atwood walked into her class, did a presentation, and she stood up and said, my dad is Nick Yaris. He was on death row, and I'm proud of him. Yes. Boom. It's a win, not in it. Yeah, so all the efforts of her mother to ostracize me from my own daughter's life, who I haven't seen in 11 years, hasn't worked. Yeah, and did you have any money left for yourself? I don't have anything. Live. No, uh, then, from, from all that. Oh, so I had enough to try, and I was with a partner, and, like, I went through everything with her. Um, I was living in Lincolnshire. I used to deliver for B&Q. I ended up going to America with her, 
I spent a hundred grand on yeah. IVF treatments, trying to have a baby. It didn't work. I spent all my money on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, my yeah. money went to other people. Yeah. In uh, love, to be to be funny, no, though, in I, love and kindness. So I'm not ashamed of being poor because I used my money for good. No, uh, to be honest, man, I apologize for asking you that because I don't think it's. I don't think no, it's right because to I'm. Ask that's the do. one thing that I keep getting attacked for is yeah. why don't I have money? And I'm nah, like, nah, because it's not. But I'm what one I mean of the is wealthiest it's, men on this planet. It's no, and, it's, in other ways. You are, but it's no one's business and i shouldn't have asked you that so i do apologize no don't um, listen to me don't yeah an honest question is not evil i just feel like because you've because you've served that long for a thing that you haven't done it the, yeah, the question's always going to be but you've got to be compensated in no. some way for that see so that people are that's think, is part he of the misnomer i'm glad you're addressing that actually you want to know what that is that's called pity money that doesn't make you go out and hustle like I did to speak before yeah, governments. It doesn't make you go out and become an author. It's pity money, and it'll make you soft. And I'm glad I didn't have that softness. I am here today because of being impoverished at times. Life in prison made it hard for you to survive now. No, it's made, it's made this time adaptable. Do you understand that word? Yeah, of course. Okay. It's been other humans out here that have kept me going. There's so many beautiful human beings out here, while the people that I've dealt with are assholes. So there's this weird mix. My mother had a great saying. There are only so many human beings on this planet, even though the planet is full of people. Find the human beings, and you'll find good. Do you? What do you do with your time, Nick? I'm finishing writing this new book. I just I, I got, don't even I don't even mean like yeah, so I mean just generally like do you, are generally you gym, I, do you drink do you no I I I go online I play chess mm -hmm. when I'm not finishing this book I stay in touch with people I try and build people up every day on Instagram and other yeah, you things do, like I. that I'm in touch with my friend Alex who I'm making a documentary about his cancer and I generally just stay focused on trying to do good. Is there a reason why you haven't went back to the U.S.? Oh, I was back to the U.S. several times, but I honestly know what's there. And what's there right now is chaos. And it's going to get worse. Yeah. We're about to see a true test of the democracy of a country. Can it hold? I don't need to be around it. Are Every, you liked in America? I love America in so many ways, but it's so violent. There's so many mass shootings, it's just so random. But are you liked over there? Yes. Because you, you are a public figure. In a weird way, yeah, but I've had a huge reach in America. I've done conferences. I love it that Tony Robbins and his wife Sage, both supporters of mine, Chris Pine, the actor, a yeah. lot of Americans love me. But I feel more comfortable and safer in the United Kingdom or in uh, Europe. That's fair enough. I do. Yeah. It's like, if I could take you on holiday and you could go live there, all the shit you went through growing up in England is memory. It's gone. Yeah. yeah. No longer affects you physically. Do you know, you know all, the, all the people who you've met, regardless of people just in the local area, in the US, the yeah. UK, whatever, you've met some big profiles. Um, mm. Do you ever feel that you're an imposter? when you meet them people. And the reason I say that is because you're a guy who's done nothing to go to jail. You've went to jail, and now suddenly Tony Robbins wants to be your friend. No, but no. Do you, do you get what I'm saying by that? Yeah, like, my mindset is always this. I am the guy actors talk about in interviews on YouTube about who they would love to meet. Yeah. I've lived this life to its fullest. I am not ashamed to stand up in recognition for myself because I did so when no one else would. When I meet anyone, and I don't care if they're like Robert De Niro, I met him, I, I met Robert Redford, I met Steve Buscemi and all these great actors, right? Yeah, yeah. Every time out, they're enamored with me because of what I went through, just like the average person, because they're average people at the end of the day. Yeah, but, but and that's what I'm saying, but so are you. Yeah, but... You know in, what I mean? Like, yeah, but in a way, not. 
Like, no, I know I understand. I'm you living. Know? Yeah, but I, honestly, when it comes to resilience, bro, like let's not get this twisted. I'm living one of the greatest life stories ever. Yeah, I get that. No, like next level, crazy, good, amazing life. Where one minute I'm in Geneva before the Human Rights Council with the president of the EU, and the next minute I'm hanging out with Jim Belushi in Oregon, and he's telling me about his latest weed that he's growing on his farm. You you are living the greatest life, in your mind, but I wouldn't I wouldn't have wanted your life. Yeah, but what is the word greatest? You know, you is, just said is that. Is it an encompassing word of both good and bad that comes together to describe something so much more than normal? Yeah. Because that's what I have. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah. Yeah, I understand. And that. look at the chance I have. I'm right now on the precipice of three major projects, and a and one. Pro project in particular is going to change hundreds of million people's lives so what am i am i just an average person or do i have a gift that's going to change you definitely the world? got a gift that's and that's what i'm saying i'm yeah. going to go with that yeah, self-belief that's why i couldn't sit in that sofa on my first day home and cry that's why when i first got out of prison and everything was aimed against me succeeding I stood up and I believed in myself more than anybody else would ever believe, and I pulled it off. Do you have compassion or empathy for people who are on death row now? Sure. Or do you think beasts that no. deserve it? No, there's some that you recognize. There's no investment of any feeling for, let them go. But I feel bad for the guy that picked up a bar, a bar stool and hit a guy, and they put him on death row. I was literally around people like that. They shouldn't have been on death row with the guy that killed someone. And, and now they're them. dead now. Right. Yeah. And now they've either been dead or they're spending the rest of your life. That's why I actually am proud that I got four people released from death row and lessened their sentence, and I proved two people innocent from death row besides myself. Is there anyone still on there now since you've been out? That I know? Like that you were in with, or they're all yeah, dead? Yeah, of course, they're still there. Still now? Yeah. Even when you were on death yeah. row? Yeah. Fucking hell, man. And they haven't been killed yet? Yeah, like Leslie Charles Beasley was put in solitary confinement to in May of 1980, and he's still there. What did he do? He killed a cop. So he's probably still, in, if he hasn't died by now, he's still in prison. Did but you know I him? know people that did 50 and 60 years by now. Did, do, you know, do you know them? Did yeah, you? a good handball player, a great friend of mine. I know these people. And, and how do you, would you, you've done your thing. You've, you've helped people escape. Like get out, sorry, exonerated yeah. and, and, and helped all the other people and stuff. And obviously for the shit you've done around the world. For the people who were in there, have you kind of turned your back on them now because it's not your life anymore? Or would you it help them? It isn't so much it? turning your life, but I have no connectivity to this. This is why I stopped writing books about death row and prison and stuff because it's no longer relative to the message. That's why I wrote The Kindness Approach about neuroplasticity healing. That's why I wrote uh, this new book, Mind Your Heart, Nick Yaris, because... I am not stuck in my yesterday. I don't live back there, and that's 20 years ago. It's like reliving the 66 World Cup. So you've got Mind Your Heart by Nick Yaris. Um, you've got these, th you're, these, I can't say the word like you, I can't remember the word you said. Neuroplasticity. No, the, the three, you, you said you're on the precipice of three major projects. Yeah. Is that the right word? Yeah, the precipice. The precipice, the precipice sorry. What does precipice mean? It's the very edge of like a mountain. Like the cusp. Like the cusp okay. of a mountaintop or a very unique setting. So you've got these three projects which are exciting. Obviously the links and stuff will be in right. there for your book and stuff like that. But 20 years since you've been out of death row, mate, where are you going? I'm going with love. If you think about it, I have no choice but to honour the good people who helped me make it to this point. You helped me. With the money you gave me last time, I took and got food for myself. Like, my car broke down today. I had to walk an hour and a half and then sat in the lobby for another hour and a half for you because I got nothing but love to go forward with. Yeah. Yeah? Not the way I do it in a brother. Yeah, so it, at least that's why I'm so happy you asked me that question because in real time, you know this is true about me. I'm going with the love, brother. Nick... I, Honestly, bro, like, I want, I want you here all day, man. Like, well. well, just be my friend and hang out. And if you're ever down, I'm always good for a great laugh or some insight. How about that? Brother. Yeah? Thank you, man. Thank you to your audience for allowing me to share this time. I'm really grateful I got to speak to you. 
And I can honestly say, I know that there's that one. Yeah. You've been suffering and carrying a lot of burdens. Don't. Let it go and come and join us and have a smile. Please and thank you. Cheers, brother. Thank you, man. Love, man. Cheers,